Statistics, confidence interval. Get ready and some coffee because if we want to get futuristic, we need statistics. By the end of this presentation, we will be able to define what a confidence interval is, understand how to calculate confidence intervals for means and proportions. When talking about means or proportions, that's really describing the type of data that we're looking at and whether that, da that data is binomial in nature or not. Oftentimes we're thinking about situations where it is not, meaning the results of any particular test could be varied. For example, if we're testing the average height of an individual in population, then any result we get from any particular test could have a varied range of results from like 510, 5'9", 6'3", and so on and so forth. But sometimes we have a binomial type of situation similar to a coin flip where for each test there's only two possible outcomes that we could have. This happens in like maybe a survey when you're asking did you like it or did you not like the product? Or are you going to vote for this candidate or are you not going to vote for this candidate? We have many of the principles that will be the same under those two circumstances, but there will be some differences as well in the calculations. So interpret a confidence interval, and then we'll identify factors that affect the width of a confidence interval. All right, first question, of course, what is a confidence interval? A confidence interval, which we can abbreviate as CI, is a range of values derived from sample data that likely contains the true value of a population parameter, e.g. the mean or proportion it's typically expressed as CI confidence interval equals the sample estimate minus the margin of error, and then on the other side, sample estimate plus the margin of error. So we have a similar scenario to what we have seen in our prior presentations with hypothesis testing. That being, we want to find information about a large population. We can't test every item in the population. Let's say we're looking for that average height again. We can't test every individual person. Therefore, the strategy must be that we're going to be taking a sample, test the sample, and see whether or not we can apply the findings found from the sample to the larger population. There's two ways that we can set this up, one being hypothesis testing, which we talked about in a prior presentation, and two being the confidence intervals that we are covering now. In a hypothesis test situation, it lends itself to situations where we think we know what that middle point is or what we think the middle point should be. We then build our bell curve around that middle point. Then we take the sample and see if the sample data is far enough away for us to say we have enough evidence in an analogical system as to a legal or criminal system in the United States do we have enough evidence to reject the original hypothesis and then say that we have some type of alternative I hypothesis, which is basically the opposite of the original hypothesized value, such as... First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com as if we thought the national average height of people was 5'10 and we found that in a high, a high degree of uh, confidence that the mean height that we got from our sample is way taller than that, like 5 or you know, 6-3 or something, we might say that we have enough evidence to reject the original hypothesis that the heights in our area, our location, is equivalent to the national average of uh, the 5-10 would be a general idea. Now the confidence interval lends itself to situations where I have no idea what the middle point is. So I can't really make a hypothesis, although we could structure 
our confidence intervals calculations in a similar fashion as the hypothesis testing. But with confidence intervals, the general idea is that we're going to do the test. We're going to take the sample, find out what the middle point is. We're going to take that middle point of our sample and then create a range around that middle point uh, uh, that will help us determine the likelihood that the actual mean of the population lies within uh, that range. So a confidence interval CI is a range of values derived from a sample data that likely contains the true value of a population parameter. So we're gonna say, here's the result that we got, here's the range around this result, and then we have that crucial component of statistics of saying, I know I'm not sure about this, we're, there's no such thing as complete confidence because we're inferring something about a subset to the larger population, but hopefully using statistics, I can, I can give some degree of accuracy or the likelihood that the number that we got is, is going to be uh, close to or the actual middle point will be within the range that we have, that we have structured. And then we're going to calculate that range by the sample estimate, meaning if we took the sample of the data and got like 6.3 uh, as, as the middle point or whatever, then we're going to take the margin uh, of error, which we talked about before is basically the standard deviation generally of the mean of all possible combinations of, of samples still taking into consideration the calculation or use of the bell-shaped curve because of the central limit theorem. And then on the other side, we have the sample error plus uh, the margin of error. Now the margin of error uh, accounts for the uncertainty in the sample estimate. So obviously we're gonna say, hey, this is what the sample is, but I'm not gonna say based on the sample, that's what I think the population is for sure, because we don't know what the population is. We're gonna set some type of parameters around it, a range, and try to get to some statistical likelihood that the actual mean of the population falls within the range that we got, that we built around the sample results that we received. So the interval provides a plausible range for the true parameter based on the sample data. So confidence level, how confident are we? The confidence level is the probability that the confidence interval will uh, capture the true population parameter. Uh, common confidence levels are 90%, 95%, and 99%. So we're gonna be thinking about the range. So we're gonna say, all right, we don't know what the middle point is. We don't know the average height of the population of our area. We have no idea. Therefore, we're not doing a hypothesis test, but rather confidence intervals. We actually test people out. And let's say we came up to like a six foot at, from our test. So the average height uh, is six feet. Sorry, I'm talking feet. I'm in the United States. I still use feet. <laughs> so, so, but we're in, so we're saying it's uh, it's it's six feet for the height of uh, the the people. So then the question is, well, how confident are we of that? Now, this is where we set that confidence level again in a similar way as we saw with the hypothesis testing when we set the alpha, and that's gonna be at a 90%, 95%, 99%. These are just common picks that we would have, 95 being the one that's probably the, the most common that correlates to the hypothesis testing that we looked at before with an alpha of 5%. And we can imagine that if we used a normal bell-shaped curve that we were going to construct around the middle point to construct our range, then the bell-shaped curve this time, you can imagine it's built not on the hypothesized value because we didn't have one, but we can imagine constructing one around the, the sample data results uh, that we have. And we know that two standard deviations out about on either side would contain around 95% of the data, more like 1.96 standard deviations on each side. And then we would have 5% you know, in the tails. That's the normal picture that we basically uh, envision. And that would be at the 95% in the middle. So by saying that, we're saying that even just by chance alone, the, the result could have been in you know the 5%. You have a 5% chance that it could be in the tails. If I want to have more confidence, then we can go up to a 99%, which will, will tighten things up and have a wider range. So that's going to be our trade off, right? So if I want to have a tighter range, then one way I can do that is lower the confidence level and then I'll have a tighter range, but the trade-off is gonna be I have less confidence because by randomness alone, 
uh, the, the, it could fall outside that range. Or if I want higher confidence, I increase the confidence level, but that's gonna end up with a larger range, uh, which, which isn't gonna be as precise of an answer. All right, so for instance, a 95% confidence level means that if we uh, repeated the sampling across many times, about 95% of the intervals calculated would contain the true population parameter. Now we actually do this in our, in our samples because if you run this in Excel, which we'll do in another course or section, then it's really cool in Excel because you can regenerate the data. And we also do it a different way where we run the tests a hundred different times. And if you run the test a hundred different times and you set a 95% parameter, then you would expect that about 95% of the time, the actual mean of the population will be within the range that you have set. So if we got a range of six foot, I mean, if we said the answer was six foot and then we set a range based on that with a 95% confidence level and said that we're gonna go from 510 to 64, that's our range because six foot was in the middle, uh, then 95% of the time, the actual mean of the population should be within that range. But 5% of the time, it's gonna be outside of that range due to chance alone, right? And so that's gonna be the issue that it's a lot easier to see that if you work the example problems, highly recommend working through the examples to really kind of grasp that. So to calculate a confidence interval for the population mean, uh, for known population standard deviation or large samples, use the, D, the Z distribution. So we had a similar situation with the hypothesis testing. This is a kind of a common point for either of the two methods that we might be using, hypothesis testing, or in this case, confidence intervals. If we know the, the, the uh, standard deviation of the population, then it's more likely that we can use a Z distribution, which is basically a normal bell-shaped type of curve. Now, if you're doing hypothesis testing, it's more likely that you might actually know that because you're probably dealing with some type of data where you think you know what the middle point is and might have an, an idea of what the standard deviation is. If you're dealing with confidence intervals and you have no idea even what the middle point is, it's probably less likely maybe in most situations that you would know what the standard deviation of the population is. But if you did know the standard deviation, then it's more likely that you would know that you would use the uh, normal uh, type of distributions uh, to, to, to go from that point. So, and the, the, the general idea is gonna be the same. We're gonna build a bell shape. We're thinking of it in terms of a bell shaped curve that we can basically create with the help and use of the central limit theorem. There are two things we need to make the bell shaped curve, the mean or middle point, which we're gonna approximate with the sample this time, instead of taking it uh, from the hypothesis test and then from the from the hypothesized value in, in a hypothesis testing and we need the standard deviation. Remembering we're not taking the standard deviation of the data or the standard deviation of the sample, but the standard deviation that we're imagining all combinations of what of the mean of whatever sample size we're using in order to consider the or take into account the central limit theorem so the standard deviation of the population if known will be part of the formula to calculate that standard deviation and if it's not known we'll go to the standard deviation of the sample so for unknown population standard deviations uh, most cases uh, or, or or smaller samples use the t distribution so if we don't know the standard deviation, we use the T distribution, which is the similar concept. You still have like a bell shaped type of curve, but the T distribution has fatter tails on it to account for the fact that we don't know the range of the population and therefore the calculation of the standard deviation of all possible combinations of sample, the, the standard error calculation will be, will be not as accurate. So how can we compensate with that? Well, we could have a, use different bell-shaped curves with fatter tails and and that means that it's going to result in a larger or wider range which is what you would expect to give you more confidence given the fact that you don't have as accurate a number of uh, for the standard uh, deviation now those these other curves the t distribution curves you will recall from a prior presentation 
from the hypothesis testing, we discussed them in a bit. Uh, there, there's multiple different curves which are based on the, the degrees of freedom, which are primarily based on the sample size and the number of samples that we have. So when we do this in Excel, Excel will actually pick the proper, uh, the proper curve based on the degrees of freedom that we put in the calculation. But it's just useful to know that as your sample size gets larger, the bell-shaped curve for a T distribution will have fatter tails and then they'll get skinnier and skinnier as N gets larger and that curve will get closer and closer to, in essence, what you would expect from a normal distribution. Also, if we're taking data that has a very small sample size, then it's less likely that the, that the central limit theorem is going to be able to kick in and help us transforming data that is not bell-shaped curve, skewed to the left, skewed to the right, normally distributed, to having a bell-shaped curve nature when we look at the mean of all combinations of possible samples. Therefore, if you have small sample size, like under 10 or so, like 10 or something like that, then you're hoping that the actual data has a bell-shaped curve to it so that so that uh, your your results will still be proper more likely to be to be taken into consideration the bell-shaped nature that we're that we're using that's usually due to the central limit theorem okay steps start with the sample mean so in this case unlike the hypothesis testing where in step one of the hypothesis test we say something like this is what the hypothesized value would be, such as the example of we know the national average of the heights of people is 510, and we're going to apply that to our average height. In our case, we don't have any idea what the middle point is. Therefore, we're not doing the hypothesis. We're just going to say, hey, I want to know what the average heights are. Therefore, we do the sample, and we start with the sample mean, the middle point from the sample to approximate the population middle point. So determine the standard error, which accounts for the sample size and uh, standard deviation. So then we're going to calculate uh, the standard error, which will have many example problems to help us see how that works in Excel if you, in another course or section, if you want to check that out. Multiply the standard error by the critical value from uh, the appropriate distribution, T uh, or Z or T. So the Z is what we're, so when we're thinking about the bell-shaped curve, we can talk about the x-axis of the bell-shaped curve either in x's, which in our case would be inches if we're talking about the heights of people, or in terms of standard deviations, which would be standard error calculations, which are usually represented in z's if a normal distribution, which we would typically use if we knew the standard deviation of the population, but if we did not, it would be in t's, which is basically the same thing. It's within standard deviations for a T distribution. So add and subtract uh, these results from the sample mean to get an upper and lower bounds uh, of the interval. So we're gonna use this data to basically create our range. So we start with the middle point and then we add the upper range and the lower range to get our range. So if we said the result was six foot and then we do this process to get the range, which might be going from like 510 to 62 or something like that. So to calculate a confidence interval for a, pop, a population proportion. So remember, what does that mean, a proportion? Why, why is this different? Notice the data could be binomial. So if we're talking about many types of data, the results we're going to get, inches, it's going to be how many inches we're talking about, how many widgets are in a box of widgets that will be produced, manufactured, then we're going to have multiple different results and we're going to have to take the average of those results. But sometimes we might have that binomial data, like a coin flip, each result only having two options, not multiple options that we can have. If we ask a question, are you going to vote for this candidate or not? The result is yes or no. Did you like the service in a survey or not? Yes or no. In those situations, the, you, you've got to think, well, how am I going to take the, the mean of the data when it's binomial. And so, so it's a little bit different. It's basically the same kind of concepts that apply, but it's a little bit different. Now with a binomial situation, you know that the data is not bell-shaped because if you made a histogram of it, it would be two poles, yes or no, right? Two, two sides to the histogram. So we have the same concept that we wanna take the, 
the 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 average of all combinations of data so that the cent the central limit theorem can kick in and we can still use kind of that bell shape uh, curve which is applicable so that same concept is in play all right so you start with the sample uh, proportion so compute the standard error uh, of of the proportion so sample proportion might be did you like do, the question on a survey did you like this you know new tv series or did you not like this new tv series we're not ranking it from one to five or one to ten we're just saying yes or no binomial situation we're going to look at the proportion of people that said yes so let's say that we took the ratio 80 percent of the people said uh yes that they that they like it that's the proportion we're looking at compute and that's you can kind of equate that to a situation where we talk about the heights as basically the mean that's kind of like the average of the data when you're looking at a binomial situation in essence so compare the standard error uh, of the proportion compute the standard error multiply by the critical value from the z distribution typically used for proportions and add and subtract these results from the sample proportion to get the interval bounds so the steps are going to be you know somewhat similar highly recommend looking at example problems and and make sure that if you're looking at some of our example problems in another course or section then uh just make sure that you check out some of them that are binomial in nature and some of them that are not binomial in nature all right several factors influence the width of a confidence interval so sample size n often represented as larger samples yield, yield narrower confidence intervals as they provide more precise estimates so once again when we when we do our testing what's going to be the size of the sample typically a larger sample size is better although again you can kind of get carried away thinking that the way the best way to improve a testing situation is just to increase n which isn't really the case because you're going to get diminishing returns beyond a certain point we want to make sure the sample size is large enough so that the central limit theorem you know is kicking in so that we can basically use kind of like that bell-shaped curve and a larger n will also decrease the width of the confidence interval which is good because it gets things to be more precise right so and so that would be nice confidence level higher confidence levels lead uh, to wider inf intervals as they require greater certainty that the interval includes the true parameter so when we set the confidence level this is the one where we set to like 95 percent confident or 90 or 99 or whatever 95 often being the baseline if i have a confidence level of 95 percent remember what that means i'm saying by chance alone then i could have a five percent chance that the sample that i took uh, uh does not have the the does, does the, the interval i made around that sample does not contain the actual mean of the population which will happen by chance alone five percent of the time so if i if i want to be more precise the trade-off is well if i go to 99 percent confidence by chance alone it's only going to be a one percent chance that that just by chance that my confidence interval does not contain the actual mean however in order to do that my confidence interval will be wider which means it'll be less specific so from our example if i was to say i got an answer or i got a a, a six foot as the average height i made a confidence interval at 95 percent confidence from 510 to uh to to six uh two but i want to be 99 percent confident well now i'm gonna to have to increase the range it might be something like now i have to go down to five nine to six three or something so i'm not as precise i'm giving up precision in order for a higher degree of confidence so variability and data standard deviation higher variability in the data results in wider confidence levels due to increased uncertainty so if there's more variability in the data then you might have more spread standard deviation spread in the data which means there'd be more uncertainty which you would expect would lead to wider confidence intervals in order to make sure that we capture that middle point so interpreting confidence levels a common mistake in interpreting confidence levels as a probability statement about the pro the, the population parameter uh, the correct interpretation is uh, we are 
uh, confidence level, 95%, 99%, depending on whatever we put in place, confident that the true uh, interval contains the true population parameter. So uh, it is important to understand that the true parameter uh, either lies within the interval or it does not. The confidence level refers to the method, not the specific interval. On summary here, confidence intervals provide a range within which we expect the true population parameter to lie based on the sample data. One more contrast between this and hypothesis testing. With hypothesis testing, we're going to say, hey, this was the national height. And we're trying to say that our height in our region, we think it's different. Therefore, we're going to choose the national height as the center point to see if we have enough evidence for us to reject that hypothesis. Here, we're saying we're going to take, the, we're going to do the test and we're going to make an interval. And the interval is going to tell us whether or give us some degree of confidence as to whether the actual uh, mean of the population is within the range. So we do the test, we get the middle point, say six foot, then we make the range around it based on the processes we have discussed. And we'll have examples upon that I think you should look at, which is like 510 to 62, let's say, and we're going to say with some degree of confidence, 95% or whatever, that the actual population uh, is somewhere within that range. So the confidence level indicates the reliability of this range. So, so we're basically, again, the, the confidence level isn't really saying, you know, it's more specific to be in the middle point or the other point. It's just saying that's how confidence it's going to be somewhere, you know, within that range. So the width of the interval is influenced by sample size, confidence level, and variability.